Now, if I play the same shot with left-hand side down the table, you would think the ball would go to the left again, but it actually goes to the right. Not so easy, that, Steve. If we accept that the table isn't on a slant, or that there isn't a magnet in the ball, then it must be something to do with the cloth, because that's the only thing that differs. The cloth is a little like a cat's fur with the hairs all pointing in the same direction. Just try striking a cat the wrong way. Of course, the cloth's hairs are considerably shorter. One of the regular jobs which you have to perform maintaining a snooker table is to iron it, always in one direction, so the nap is always laid facing up the table. One has only to feel with one's fingers to... Well, I think uh, I detected, detected a slight kick there from uh, that contact. Yes, the referee is cleaning the ball. I thought there was a, um, a nasty-sounding contact there. You look pretty upset there, Steve. Yes, I was. I felt I hadn't played the shot uh, at all badly and got punished for it with a kick. And as you see, Cliff Thorburn asked Rangani, the referee, to clean the balls, to take all the chalk off. But I'm not too sure that that's re the reason for, for kicks. Perhaps it's due to static electricity. Mm. And uh, in, in cleaning the balls, the referee might be putting more static on. Well, this looks like something I can investigate, Steve. And perhaps we ought to start by the sound of the contact of the two balls. Now, in the semi-final itself, both you and Cliff Thorburn and the commentator were able to detect that there was a different sound on that kick. That's right. Yeah. Yes, but we didn't hear it in the studio, and that's probably because the sound didn't come through the microphone. Right. So what, uh, what we'll do now is we'll put the microphone next to the red ball, and if you can play the cue ball into the red ball, we'll see what the normal sound sounds like. That was good. a good contact. Good. Now what we will do, we'll try and put some static charge into the the cue ball here and do the whole thing again. Perhaps you ought to take the chalk off the end of your cue so okay. there's no chalk at all on the ball. Now touch it onto a gold leaf electroscope. Yes, statically charged. I'd like you to, to pop the red ball and we'll see if there's any difference. No, not at all. That's a normal sound again? Yeah, perfect. All right, now then. We'll take a red ball and put some chalk on here because that way you'll be absolutely certain that the chalk will contact as the two balls right, okay. hit each other. So there's chalk on the red ball there. And we'll put that down there. And if you can then hit the cue ball onto the red ball, we'll see if there's any difference there. Yeah. There's a definite sound difference that's there. That's right, it was a kick. Well, of course, that's not uh, conclusive evidence, but it does seem as if it may be the, uh, the answer to finding out what causes a kick. Right, back well, to the game. Let's carry on, then. Yeah. Sure. Could we see it again? Yeah, sure. Yes, it's the same again. I think it's fairly easily explainable, Steve. This machine represents the action of the ball on the cloth. This is a spring balance which will show the frictional force of the ball against the table as the ball's moving over. As I start to turn the wheel, you can see that this red indicator shows that there's a frictional force as the ball is skidding across the table. Now, as I increase the speed, which means that the ball is skidding harder, the frictional force doesn't vary. It stays the same. When I stop the machine, this is when the ball is pure rolling and there's no frictional force at all. Now, if you relate this to what happened on the table, when the ball is skidding, the frictional force is in operation and then it's taken off instantaneously. And that's why the ball appears in the line of the net. And as you can see, whichever way it starts to curve, it continues that way. Now, could you roll a ten pence piece back against the net? Like this, Steve.
Now, this time it did an S. Is that what you expected? No, it isn't. I think it must be something to do with the fact that when you roll coins across the table, they'll always go towards you down the nap. Watch this. Even coins like that, which start up the table, always come towards you. In fact, it's a very good way to win a bet. I'll call heads. I think we must look closer at the coin rolling over the cloth. Here, the fibers of the nap are pointing to the right. So if we look at the right-hand side of the coin, the explanation will start to appear. The individual threads are acting as little springs, each pushing the coin over. It's not much, but clearly it's enough. And while we're looking in close-up, let's see if the antique book had it right for the curving of the ball. Again, the fibers are pointing to the right. Now that's the maximum height of contact at the back of the ball. We're looking for a greater height of contact at the front, and there it is, that much. So they had it right in 1899. Right, well, I've got 32, so I think I'd better declare that you have a chance here. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> what do you think about that? Problem is, I always have problems with the long shots. Well, if you're going for the black from there, it would be a very, very difficult shot. Um, I tend to, in practice, practice a lot of long shots, especially a long straight shot. Um, and I, I usually line all the 21 balls up in a line along from the middle pockets and lining up the white ball straight with every ball, try and pop them into the top corner pockets from different positions. And uh, I play a little game with myself, really, as a practice method and try and get at least 11 of the 21 in. Well, Steve, if a top-class player like you can only get 50% of long pots, then that goes to prove the difficulty. And Professor George Mackey of Edinburgh University has used his computer to help study this. Right, I'll have a word with him. Well, George, how do you set up a computer to judge the comparative difficulties of pots on a snooker table? Well, let me show you. If you're potting a coloured ball, it doesn't have to go into the very centre of the pocket. There is an angular variation it can make, which would still enable it to go in. But anything more than that angle, and it would miss altogether. Right. What the computer does is calculate the angular tolerance in the white ball, which would enable the black ball to go in. Right. And that measures the difficulty of the pot. The smaller the angle, the more difficult the pot. I've tried to simplify things by getting what I call a difficulty factor. And that I estimate by setting up a pot which occurs very frequently in, in snooker, particularly at the professional level, the straight pot of the, of, the black, of yes. the black from there. And that I call a pot with difficulty factor one. A pot with difficulty factor two would be twice as difficult because the angular error you can make in that case is only half the angular error you can make in this case. Um, but what about the situation that Peter finds himself in? Yes, well, let's set that one up, then. That's that part there. All right. Well, uh, that has got difficulty factor 10.2. It's about ten times as difficult as the standard part is. OK. Um, what do you think the purpose of this is? Well, I... I think it's interesting to be able to give a, a, a number to associate with the difficulty of any given pot. I would hope the television commentators might be interested in explaining this to the viewing audience. But um, there's another application uh, which makes use of some ideas in statistics. It enables you to tell the frequency with which you might be able to succeed with any given pot if you know the frequency with which you would be able to execute the standard pot. Right. For example, would you like to know your chance yes, of getting that uh, How many uh, times out of pot? ten? Well, for somebody like Peter, who might uh, be able to execute the standard pot, say, nine times out of ten, probability 0.9, his probability of getting the more difficult pot is 0.13, which means he'd get it about once in eight times. 
if you could pot the uh, standard pot 99 times out of 100, then the probability is 0.2, which means you'd get the more difficult pot about once in every five occasions. Right. But even someone like you, Steve, who could probably get the standard pot 999 times out of 1,000... That's if it's still awake. <laughs> your probability of success with the difficult pot is just 0.26, which means about only once in four occasions would you get the most more difficult pot. So I'd still be right to buy the safety shot. One Indeed. in four's not good enough. I'm right. sure you would, yes. Thank you. Very nice. OK, Steve, back to the game. Oh, good shot. 13. Ah, now there's a, there's a difficult, well, <laughs> difficult, an interesting situation comes up quite a lot in snooker, especially when there's lots of reds on the table. I've only got two left. Um, both the balls are lined up for the pocket. So really, it's quite a simple shot, and uh, plenty of people could do it. And then after you putted that blue, it should be no trouble. Just to uh, hit the second red, onto the first red. And then it'll go straight it in. Go in. It's normally said that if you draw a line through the centres of these two balls and aim at the back one, the front one will follow the line no matter where you hit it from. And of course, knowing this helps me to play trick shots. Watch this. Another question answered. So I shouldn't have any trouble potting this then? Let's hope not. Right. Oh dear. 14. Well, it's not bad. Perfectly on the blue. Yeah. Now, so you had, you had more ch better shot with the other ball. But um, what you should be able to do, really, for any, any sort of pot, is where it doesn't matter where it is, um, take it around here, is um, to actually imagine another white ball in line with the blue, the same as the, the two ball set we've just had. And if you oh, could Im the same way the two reds were? That's right. And if you could actually imagine where the white ball will appear, And you should pot the ball. So it's just a case yeah, of I see. getting down on the shot, imagining where the white ball would be. And that works every time. Perhaps I should have told you earlier, but that's my edge. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's the end of my break with 14 to go on. Right. Well, I'm on the red. And as you can see, just a case of lining up on the imaginary white. And once again, the red ball should go in. Show me how to do it again, then. Right. Right down the middle. Right. And now a nice position for the blue. So science has explained everything so far, Steve. Is there any other aspect of the game that you think science can 